Well, thank you for sticking with us. Uh, this is the final and maybe the best session of the, uh, of the day. Um, so we've talked already a, a lot about impact of standards, and we're going to talk now about ethical, uh, ethical trading issues and issues around ethical supply chains, where standards obviously make a huge impact. And I'm very pleased to welcome our next keynote speaker. Uh, he is the Executive Director of the Ethical Trading Initiative. So please welcome Peter McAllister. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for inviting me to share a few thoughts from my experience. But what possibly they didn't know when they invited me is as a very young junior engineer, I was qualified to BS 5750 and doing quality assurance. So cut my teeth on the value of standards at a very early age, because as a young fellow going into um, often offices with much more experienced people, the standard was the reference point, and that allowed me to open up conversations and develop arguments and improve the circumstances. So it's really great to sort of come full cycle and share a bit of my experience. Ethical Trading Initiative, some of you may know it, but essentially we are an organisation that brings together companies, trade unions and NGOs. We look at human rights in global value chains. So that can be China, India, South Africa, Kenya, but it can also be Leicester and it can be Spain and it can be Italy. Sadly, we see there are problems in very many parts of the world in global supply chains. Um, there were some words up on a Mentimeter thing which I thought was, was quite useful when I came in. So I quickly looked at the Oxford Dictionary and their definition of ethical is of or relating to moral principles. So you might ask, well, what's that got to do with me and is this a good moment to be doing some emails or catch up on a few shut-eye moments? Well, I hope I'm going to show you why it matters to business, to institutions, and that this approach to standards for ethical trade is really, really important. Partly because not everything is covered in law. So I would expect institutions and companies, um, certainly from Europe and the UK, try their best efforts to understand law in their country of origin, but also where they may have partnerships and respect law. But that won't tell you, for example, how to deal with caste in India. It won't tell you how to deal with sexual harassment on a tier state where women freely give sex to make sure they've got a job. It's not against the law. So the moral issues of ethical trade go beyond just pure regulation and have to look at a whole range of practices which, I'm sad to say, are out there and affect our world and affect supply chains. So it's part of businesses reflecting social values. Now again, some of us are old enough in the room to have seen that change dramatically over time, mostly for the better. And businesses that don't reflect social values and don't keep up with society's expectations are likely to be targeted, are likely to be on the news panorama, and also fall behind in terms of attracting and keeping talent. So this is a journey that businesses are consistently on and organisations are consistently on to understand and reflect where society is around various issues. An example of that, I think, comes from the work that we did with H&M. They did a big piece of work on wages in their global value chain. And it was moderately successful. There were some challenges with it. But what they hadn't appreciated was the incredibly positive feedback they got internally from their colleagues saying, this is the sort of company we want to work for. We want to work for a company that is pushing standards and raising standards, not just buying and selling clothes. So it matters. It matters to a business, to an organization, what they do and, and how they do it. It also matters to shareholders. More and more shareholders are asking about modern slavery or your human rights due diligence. So the ability to be able to have that dialogue and demonstrate that you understand standards and that you're looking at the ethical trade issues within your business and within your supply chains matters because it reassures shareholders. And it's also about living values. Almost all organizations somewhere on their website will have a set of good things to say. But if they're hollow, if they're meaningless, if they're just posters on a wall, you very quickly get found out, either internally by your partners or more broadly. There's that sort of mythical few minutes in, a, in an elevator. Well, I managed to spend literally about a minute and a half with a member of the Mars family in their elevator. And he said to me, two things you need to hear. This was child labor back in the day. He said, we've had more correspondence about the shade of blue on our new M&Ms than we had ha we've had about child labor. But my name's on the product, so we are going to lean into this issue and address it because it matters. So both of those things were true. 
So that's why I think any organization, any business needs to think about what is going on in the world of supply chains and to what extent are we a force for good or are we ignoring the potential risks. BSI standards are really helpful in that. You've already got standards on anti-bribery, environment, social response, uh, social responsibility, HR management. So there's already lots of standards in the toolkit, as it were, that you can reflect on as you start to do that work and build out that journey. The overarching framework for this now is the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. And some of you may know this already, so forgive me if I'm telling you things you already know. That basically breaks into three parts. The protect pillar is all about government's duty to protect citizens. And again, that comes in in terms of nationalizing international standards, having the right bodies in place, having checks and balances, having authorities and bodies that will do factory checks or health and safety or child, um, child protection. The middle pillar, respect, is about businesses and organizations' duty to respect human rights. So if you like, we go from ethics, which is a sort of slightly fluffy word, now into something which is more precise and saying, to what extent do you as an organization or as a business understand the impact you might be having on human rights and what are you doing about it? So the businesses have a duty to understand and protect. For quite a long time since they were launched, 2011, that's been soft law. So you could do it, you could not do it. If you were a retailer, if you were certainly in the apparel and textile sector, you were under a lot of scrutiny, so you certainly started to do things. But there was no requirement. Since 2017, you have a law in France, now in Norway, and most recently in Germany. And across the European Union, we now have something which is nicely called the CSDDD, which is looking at both environmental and human rights due diligence. So we're moving from soft law into hard law, and again, into the area of where standards can help you. The main reason I think this is important is no business that's going to be sustainable can be built on exploitation, whether that's exploitation of the planet or exploitation of people. Ultimately, that erodes credibility, advantage, quality in so many other aspects. We've seen it time and time again. Without talking out of school, if you look at the news around Boohoo, that brand has suffered consistently by not being able to convince people that it's operating ethically. If you look more recently at the news around um, pineapples in Kenya, again, not able to convince people that that operation is run ethically, it's hurting that brand. It's less available on the shelves than it used to be. So it matters, the, this has a real impact. And again, the, the reason this, that, that this is connected to rules and standards is it cannot be a free-for-all. This is not about making up your own ideas about what you should and shouldn't do. Standards and rules and guidance give you a backdrop for that work. Um, I've been not following my clicker, so let's have a look. Somewhere on here, we've got who we are. But what I was really wanting to show you is that. So I was asked to talk about supply chain risks. This is a great little tool called the MVO Risk Checker. It's free to use, it's run by a Dutch organization, and what they do is they collect information on corruption, human rights, um, climate change and what have you, and they map that out. And this is often where I first start with boards and say, tell me a country that you're sourcing from or working in. And you click on there and all of a sudden you start to get the sort of issues that you're facing with. If you click through, you get sources like ILO, US State Department, credible reports from Save the Children, NGOs and what have you. So this isn't just made up, this is based on really credible information. And what it tells you is, in a very busy globe, you are exposed to risk. It might not be immediately obvious, but typically in supply chains, second and third tier, you're exposed to risk. So if you want to be ethical, you're going to have to start to understand the impact of that. Now, again, I, I don't want to demonize any of these countries. I've spent many years living abroad, and I've had a fantastic experience and always been made welcome wherever I've gone. It's a recognition that structures, political, institution are not always as robust as we'd like them to be. And again, let's not say it's always over there. If you look at the seasonal agricultural worker scheme in the UK, another mouthful, it is shocking. We're bringing people into this country in debt and at risk of modern slavery. So this isn't always somewhere else. This is also on our doorstep. The point being, you need to be alive to the fact that risk exists. And therefore, we have a duty to understand that and take action. In many of these countries, the checks and balances of civil society and media are being squeezed. 
So the ability to hear about these things, either through campaigners or media, is getting squashed. I used to live in India in the 90s, and it's a slightly chaotic place. You either love it or hate it. I loved it. But you could say anything you like to anybody. And the media was a sort of cacophony of different voices. People now self-censor in India. They're worried about saying the wrong thing. And so the ability to detect what's going on and find out what's happening and how to act is becoming more and more difficult. And that's a challenge for business because the scrutiny on business and the expectation on organizations is greater than ever before. You might argue unfairly because typically, or sometimes at least, businesses are being asked to fix problems which are really a failure of governance. But the reality is if you're not aware of those environments, if you're not cognizant of the risks if you're not taking action, you could easily get into trouble. So what does it mean to respect rights? Sometimes it's obvious. Many of these things, again, going back to BSI standards that of old, are health and safety standards. They're to do with fire escapes, some basic things that we would all expect to be done, just as a matter of course. So why wouldn't we expect that to be the same in a farm in Spain that grows the salad vegetables that we enjoy, where there might be no toilets and no water in the heat of the sun at 40 degrees? Why would we accept that? We shouldn't. But they're not always straightforward. If you look at the coup in Myanmar in February 2021, there were campaigners on both sides of the argument. You should stay because you're providing employment and that keeps people away from poverty. You should go because you're directly or indirectly supporting a coup. We were able to lean on UN guiding principles and associated standards to come up with guidance and advice for business on how to navigate that conversation. Still not easy, but we're able to do that because those standards exist. So for me, standards provide an essential reference and guide for organizations and businesses navigating their world. It means that each company or each organization doesn't have to make it up for themselves, doesn't have to work out each time what is child labor, what is not child labor, what is forced labor, what is not forced labor. These have already been carefully considered and debated by experts. Are they perfect? Typically not, but they are there. They mean that we don't have to recreate them each time. It means it can depoliticize a conversation I was saying to someone earlier, working in southern India, we get very quickly into a conversation about who am I to come to India and, and talk about what should or shouldn't be done. But India has ratified the conventions on the rights of the child. They've ratified the conventions on child labor. So you use those standards as the basis of the conversation, not what I want or where I come from. Also, standards allow us to share lessons. They allow us to share experience. One of the values of ETI that I'm told consistently is that safe space to hear from what others have done. How do they cope with the situation? And again, tie that back to standards that allows us to have that conversation around something which is an anchor point, if you like. They typically come with guidance. They typically come with a support community. This event today, I think, is a good example of where I'm sure you've bumped into people or met people that you say, well, this is what's going on in my world, what's going on in yours. So standards have this sort of ecosystem around them that I think are really valuable in the ethical trade space. So I'm going to finish off by saying... In summary, ethical trade for me is essential to sustainable trade. Sustainable trade is about making sure the planet and the people today and tomorrow are able to benefit. It supports business and it's based on international standards. It helps business understand their role, it helps protect their reputation, it deals with shareholder impact and more and more it helps them respond to hard law. Now, none of that's easy, but I think that's that ecosystem of ethical trade and standards, it means it applies to everybody and it levels the playing field. As I said earlier, I think demands on businesses are increasing and they're more varied. So businesses being able to lean on good standards is really vital rather than having, as I said earlier, to sort of make them up or having to go it alone. So I think standards, therefore, are an essential tool to support business in its ethical trade journey. I hope some of those insights have been useful. I'm looking forward to joining my, my co-panelists to have a further discussion. And again, thank you very much for allowing me to share a few thoughts. Thank you. Peter, please, I might ask Davina and uh, Andy to come and join us as well. Um, I'll introduce you guys in a second. But um, Peter, we might just dip into some of, those, some of those points that you made there. You said there at the end about sustainable trade needs ethical trade. Can you just unpack that for us? 
Well, I guess the point is, what's sustainability? Typically, we get very quickly into a conversation about carbon and trees, what have you, which is essential, there's no doubt about that. But ultimately, who are we saving the planet for? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not aardvarks, mm -hmm. it's people. So the people part of sustainability is just as important. And it's as much as a now issue. As I say, sexual favours for work, having your garments made by people working six days a week, 12 hours a day, none of us want to see that. None of us want to be part of that. So sustainability, both in those big climate change issues and that nexus between those and the rights of people today and in the future, for me, is that bigger conversation about ethical trade and sustainability. Yeah, yeah. And it's a, I mean, it's a hugely interesting but complex area. Uh, is it getting more, as we get more and more standards and there's more and more ex levels of, higher levels of expectation, is it getting simpler to navigate? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I, I think, I mean, I was speaking to an engineering company's board last week, and, you know, there's a little bit of terror in the room when you introduce someone like me, because I think they're going to, they think I'm going to wag my finger and tell you how terrible they are. But the reality is business drives economies, it drives jobs, it drives macroeconomies, it drives microeconomies, it puts children through school. Business is a great thing. But in the modern context, business is expected to understand much more about its wider footprint and its wider world. Mm -hmm. It doesn't stop at the factory gate anymore. Mm -hmm. So yes, it is more complex, but at the same time, with things like standards and UN guiding principles, there's more tools in the toolkit than there were. Right, absolutely. And people, are, I guess, are more switched on to looking for these things as well. Correct. Thanks for showing us that tool, by the way. I'm contractually obliged to say the BSI also has a tool like that called Oops, Connect. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, uh, if the boss is listening. Um, Davina Barber has joined us as well. Davina's Senior Safeguarding Advisor at Save the Children UK. Um, Davina, talk, talk to me about some of the types of challenges and, and opportunities that you see around ethical supply chains. I think... Um, Peter's really set quite a good sort of context for some of the issues and challenges that a lot of people have been listening to um, today. Um, when you kind of think about the area of either the modern slavery standard, the, the new kind of uh, safeguarding standard, or um, some of the other standards that we've spoken about today, how I think there's been a phenomenal push for ethical supply chains and making sure trading is, is fair and Actually, a lot of businesses and organisations would say that's something we're very happy to sign up to and something that we know that the younger generation are extremely focused on. Mm -hmm. But then how do you actually then put that into practice? Mm -hmm. um, you know, as Peter said, you don't want to be walking around kind of, you know, wagging your finger and, um, you know, people being fearful of audits. But it's really important to kind of get that kind of level of information to make sure that your best practice is actually... Um, you know, kind of truthful and transparent, you know, when we talk about things like people being, um, you know, sexually harassed um, in the workforce or perhaps they're in a situation where they appear to be um, consenting to the conditions that they're in. Mm -hmm. But actually, it's kind of for that organisation to really drill down and have a look. Well, well, perhaps these people have actually been coerced by the circumstances that they're in and therefore, no, this supply chain is not very ethical but then what are we going to do about it? So when we relate that to standards, there are, I think, particularly, you know, where you have smaller organisations that don't really have the resources mm -hmm. or capabilities of, of, of hiring a, you know, an ex expensive group of consultants that, um, that can kind of rectify some of those issues quite quickly, you can kind of be in a position of looking at some of those guidance documents and starting from that point of, OK, at least now we know some of the standards that... We, you know, some of the, even the minimum standards that we have to kind of implement and how we can then build on that. But I think that transparency point's really important when you think about things like forced labour, when you think okay. about things like child labour, because quite often you're, it, it's a very hidden um, area of abuse and exploitation. So it, it's not something that you're going to be able to, to potentially easily detect mm. in, in, in some areas. I was going to say, how, how ambitious are you for a kind of global consensus on some of these topics, given different levels of expectations and different uh, situations and cultural situations, economic situations? I mean, is it even realistic to talk about global consensus? It's, um, I think it's a huge challenge, but one thing that we can sort of lean on is that there are agreed principles and there are definitely the kind of humanistic values that... Um, we can kind of look towards and that's something that you know when you talk to people you know if you if you're changing kind of hearts and minds in that kind of global context around 
the basic human right of living free from abuse or living free from exploitation, that's something that's really fundamental that I think most people would, would find, you know, you'd be a pretty cold and callous person not to kind of agree with that principle. Mm -hmm. So when you, know, when you think about, like I said, the challenge then comes of how you actually then put that into that practice. Yeah, implementing it. Thank you, Davina. Um, Andy Brown joins us, Chief Sustainability Officer at Anglian Water. So, Andy, you've been involved in standards, and in, in particular the Purpose PAS 808, which is going to become an ISO standard, we hope. Tell us about your journey into standards and y your work at Anglian Water. Yeah, uh, and thank, thank you very much for inviting me. So, um, my kind of introduction to standards, kind of on a very one-to-one -one basis, came from the decision that our board took a few years ago to change our Articles of Association and to embed environmental and social purpose in, into those articles. Um, when they did that, they changed the duty on directors, but they also said, as a business, we want to be held accountable to a set of responsible business principles. And we looked kind of out across the market, both in the UK and, and uh, more globally, and actually said, well, there seemed to be something missing, a standard that really defined what a purpose-driven organisation was, mm -hmm. And beyond performance, kind of how it gets embedded within the, the kind of constitution of the company, decision-making processes, um, the kind of way you measure it, the way you report on it. So that's really when our board said, we can't find anything, go and have a chat to BSI and, mm -hmm. and see whether there's an appetite to create one. Um, so that was back in 2019, I think, just before um, you know, the, the pandemic. And after a couple of years of fantastic work that the, the committee, the steering committee for PAS 808, um, did, and a brilliant technical author, um, drawing out a huge amount of um, information from ISO 37000, the kind of governance standard, um, PAS 808 was born. And it, it very much, you know, what, what we were hearing about earlier, which was about putting the well-being of people and planet right at the top that that is your kind of ultimate purpose and how you embed that within an organization and that's not to say that creates a perfect organization by any stretch of the imagination but it's putting the building blocks in place to try and ensure you are delivering against that purpose kind of going forward and now I chair um, G17 which is the group that's looking at taking PAS to, to an ISO um, guide. Yeah. Great work on that. We are going to throw this open in a minute, so we'll get your questions ready. Um, Andy, I mean, you wouldn't expect me to gloss over the challenges that the water industry is facing in the UK right now. Um, how do you see standards playing a positive role in, in the current situation? Yeah, I mean, absolutely, whether it's kind of a standard on, on specific elements or something like kind of PAS 808, which is looking at, at that kind of the whole corporate setup and structure. Um, yeah, I think that that, that is incredibly useful and part of my role so my role was created almost off the, off the back of looking at the development of PAS 808 um, that we decided to create a chief sustainability officer which has a kind of dual role reporting into the director of quality and environment but also directly to the CEO but also thinking about the business model mm -hmm. that you might move to um, can be incredibly supportive and you know, it's going to be critical, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, we're going to throw it open, so I'm going to look for a few hands uh, in the minute. The lights are bright, but if I can see everybody, we can just about move to it. Um, while they're thinking of their difficult questions, um, Davina, I might just come back to you on safeguarding and that question about what is, I mean, how can we define it and how do you see uh, standards changing, driving change in areas around safeguarding? Yeah, so I think if we put that into the organisational context, how, what measures does the organisation take to make sure that the people that come into contact with the organisation is able to be um, kept and protected um, from harm, whether that be you know, different forms of harm, of abuse, exploitation, neglect, you know, kind of more specifically, um, you know, that differentiation between where some people may say, but 
you know, isn't health and safety, isn't that a type of harm? Mm. You know, that, that's really the area that we're focusing on and also protecting um, groups which are going to be more vulnerable. So, you know, that's always going to be children, it's going to be adults at risk. When we think about those um, conflict areas, that, you know, where some of these supply chains may be for some of the areas that um, people have their operations, you are going to have a, a more of a likelihood to have these more vulnerable groups. So the measures that the organisation is taking is going to be um, extremely important. Now, obviously, that's going to be split up into different areas. So to kind of simplify that, you know, you often have um, pillars of prevention. So your prevention model, so, you know, um, it's far easier to make sure your operations are safe before it gets to that point of a safeguarding issue, concern um, actually happening. But of course, when that does happen, what's your response? Mm -hmm. um, we have, unfortunately, in the area of safeguarding, you know, I think a lot of people in the room will be quite familiar with a lot of safeguarding scandals that have happened, whether it be in, you know, the sector I'm in at the moment, um, the international aid sector, but, you know, in, in many areas, actually, um, many uh, business industries, um, it, it, it's one of those areas where just, just one particular incident can really have a huge impact and risk on brand and reputation. Now, obviously, as a safeguarding um, professional, I have to point out that, you know, our emphasis should be on um, responding and protecting potential survivors and victims that are involved, rather than looking at the reputation kind of element. Mm -hmm. But that can be very persuasive when you have perhaps... Um, leadership or hearts and minds that, you know, are finding it difficult to kind of change, you know, the internal culture or change their internal processes because maybe there's an impact to finance. Mm -hmm. Maybe there is an impact because, you know, what's your change management culture like within your, your organisation? You know, you'd be very surprised that a lot of people will definitely say the right things when they go perhaps to their safeguarding training or to... Um, I'm sure it used to happen before with, you know, health and safety training as well, but when that then translates to actually having to change something, that, you know, you, there can be a level of um, resistance. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I hope so that answers. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, so that re change, the resist how you deal with that resistance, Peter, um, wh what, who, who are the big drivers? Is it the customer? Is it the employee? Is it the shareholder? Well, uh, when you see an organisation like yours, you're advising companies, but well, what's driven them to it? Is it the companies themselves or is yeah, it that's a, that's a good question. I don't think there's one answer to that. I think sometimes it's companies caught in the headlights and they're scrabbling around for someone to help them mm -hmm. know what to do. Sometimes a new champion comes into a company who's maybe worked somewhere before or worked with, say, the children, and they sort of increase the, uh, the debate. And sometimes it's, it's as Anglian Water have done. They've, they've thought this through and said, well, actually, we want to be different. Now, who can we speak to that can help us on that? that journey. So it comes from different places, but the resistance isn't always only with the lead firm. Um, often you then get, as I said, in India, and we're dealing with something in Turkey at the moment, a resistance to, well, you don't understand how it operates in mm -hmm. Turkey. You don't understand this is our culture, this is how it's normalised. And you can't impose change and expect it to be sustainable. So you have to be willing to have to go on that journey and have the conversation and listen and find ways through to sort of come to a mutual agreement. You asked me earlier on about, you know, is it more difficult? One of the positives in all of this is there are a lot more organisations now willing to partner with you. So Save the Children and many others in the past would have, would, wouldn't have put them with business, whereas I think there's a recognition that it's partly a challenge, but it's also partly a journey. We'll either win on this together yep. or, or we'll fail together. Mm -hmm. On that partnerships question, Andy, in Anglian Water, is that something that you've contemplated? Is this something that you do? You work with external partners to help you to deliver that more purposeful agenda? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, um, both, both kind of down the supply chain, but also kind of up with the customers um, as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, it, it, you know, we are not experts in, in everything, if, <laughs> in anything. So bringing in those experts to, to advise us and to help us to understand... You know, what actually, because I, I guess particularly what really interests me is how do you make an impact? It's not just mm -hmm. about, you know, how do you demonstrate that you're doing something? It's how do you make the greatest impact? So whether that, from an environmental perspective, is working with the Rivers Trust on, on how we create new nature-based solutions rather than building traditional um, carbon-intensive solutions, or whether it's working with, um, you know, kidney the, the Kidney UK charity on, on how our customers might need extra water if they're dealing with dialysis. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those partnerships are absolutely invaluable. Yeah. 
Great. All right, let's open this up. Let's see if there are any questions in the audience. I see we have one. Any, uh, let's see if we can take a group of three, maybe. Maybe that's the best way forward. Anybody else with, on this side of the room? We're two, we have two here, so Sharon. Hi. As a disabled person, I'm very interested that when you're showing those countries an ethical way of working, their employment, because those countries hide their disabled people, I know that only too well, they need to know a self-worth and they need work. Do you incorporate that when you are discussing to employ disabled people and that it, we are worthwhile employing? Mm -hmm. That's a great, so let's come on yeah. to that question about disabled, accessible uh, uh, jobs in the, the workplace, Helen. Um, hi, thank you. Um, I'm just interested in um, how standards can help, um, particularly consumers to make kind of the, the right and informed choices that help drive positive business change within this area. And particularly with kind of utilities and water, um, when often consumers don't have a choice in who provides their service. So how can they help organisations, uh, responsible business, businesses, to drive that positive change in their supply chains? Great, so that's another driver, isn't it? The consumer driver. So maybe we can, we, you can take out either of those. So the question about consumer uh, driver and the informed consumer and the importance of the consumer being informed. And then that question that you might pick up, Peter, about globally, uh, or, or you, Davina, about people with disabilities and how they are treated in the workplace. Any volunteers to go first? Thank you. Yeah, um, I mean, I think Peter will probably speak a bit more about um, kind of the, the, the slide and the kind of the different countries and what you may have experienced there. But um, yeah, absolutely. The importance of making sure that the welfare um, of the uh, workforce is, is, is diversely represented, that absolutely includes making sure that, you know, organisations have an em emphasis on recruiting people who are disabled or have learning needs or perhaps have um, hidden disabilities as well, um, which is something that, you know, is, is often overlooked. Um, the, where standardisation can really help in that is, again, that, that kind of that guidance element and, and also, that, that, also that, that requirement as well that this isn't something that's optional anymore for a lot of businesses and organisations. It, it's not kind of um, fair to say that we're just going to look at things like, um, you know, how people may perform in a certain kind of recruitment um, um, procedure. Um, it's organisations have to do a lot more to make sure that their their workforce is diverse, and that includes people that perhaps in the past have been, or not even in the past, in, in some of the countries, or, or or indeed here, are going to be more vulnerable to losing those opportunities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Peter, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. Of course, in, in some countries, there's still a stigma for, for um, people with disabilities, and in many other countries, there's certainly not a proactive force to include them. So, um, to, to our shame, I think for the first ten years, we didn't acknowledge that as ETI. I think is in 2017. I'm not 100% sure that we developed guidance with the disability community on how do you start to embrace this and how you start to look at it. So, a start, and I will be the first to say it's a start. The, the other thing that we're now doing is with companies starting to say, now you need to look at your salient risk, and that should be a much more inclusive approach than a tradi traditional audit. So typically social audits were done, and that's almost a sort of, is, are there any obvious problems, and if not, fine. This is starting to say, well, who are the vulnerable groups? Who should you be talking to? Are you talking to them, not just to people about them? So it's a journey, and some countries are more advanced and others, but there's a lot more work to do to really make this inclusive standards. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Andy, that consumer question, how does the consumer dynamic work with an organisation like yours? Yeah, so if I can answer that in kind of two, two parts. I guess the first part in terms of creating um, the best accessibility to the company. Um, you know, we've um, been certified against the, the BS standard against that, particularly from a uh, the perspective of vulnerable customers, so that's really, really important. Um, I guess mentioning PAS 808 again, just to kind of plug it, principle four in that is about the kind of value chain, and, and that includes how you interact with your customers as, as kind of valued stakeholders. We've taken a, a, um, a kind of multi-layered approach to that, so we have a what's called a, a customer online community, which has around up to 600 customers on there, where they can put forward questions, challenge us as, a, as an organisation, but we can also 
put topics um, and test kind of methodologies with them. Then one of the things I did uh, about two or three years ago was say, well, can we elevate, can, can we reach out to that online community and actually create a customer board mm -hmm. that will kind of sit alongside our management board and kind of challenge them and, again, allow us to have a deep dive with, with them. So they are 12 customers picked from across the region who are willing to come and spend some time with us. And we had a customer board meeting on, on Monday and I can... Um, yeah, very hand on heart say it was a challenging and robust <laughs> session. And, and that sits alongside a thing called an independent challenge group that we have, which has got the kind of representatives of different stakeholders. So the Consumer Council for Water are on there and, and various other statutory agencies. So those different layers, I think, allow a kind of a multiple approach to access the company to challenge us. And, and you know, we're really open to challenge. Yeah, that's the way to improve. We have the British Standards Society in the same, uh, in the same vein to uh, challenge us about our own model. Um, maybe just to pick up a little, oh, unless we've got any more, qu any more immediate questions. We've got one at the back. Any more questions? So, Nick Hyvens again from um, CPIN and CA. And I do apologise for having two bites of this particular cherry. But I'd like to ask Andy, um, you talk about consumer... Um, uh, involvement. Could you not provide a dedicated phone number to Citizens Advice and similar things who represent those vulnerable people? Because I know you don't at the minute because you cover back in them. Um, and it would be really helpful if we could have a hotline if we have a vulnerable consumer with an issue. It does take days to get through to you. There's some direct customer feedback. Yeah, no, I, I, and I was in the session this morning when you asked that question. I made a note of that to go back and talk to our um, director of customer and wholesale. So I'm going to be taking that back. And yeah, we've had some very interesting conversations with Citizens Advice um, across the region um, as well. So yeah, um, I'll, I'll be taking that one back and asking. We're going to make sure Andy's here next year, Nick, so you can ask him again if it hasn't happened. Um, maybe touch on di on digital, and because uh, obviously the the world of global trade is is changing and becoming ever more digital. Uh, there's lots of challenges around the informed consumer uh, with online purchases. I mean, presumably there are still ethical issues behind the consumer. I don't know whether, uh, but Davini, you want to pick up any of those or, or, or Peter? What's the. I mean, I think, that? yeah, at the moment, the how organisations are going to be able to adequately kind of innovate and keep up is mm. really important in the digital world. Um, if we look at the area, for example, within safeguarding, and it kind of reminded me from the question that the gentleman just asked, but you know how your reporting mechanisms mm -hmm. can actually be really enhanced by things like digital. Mm -hmm. So you know an example of um, you know people that may be um, exploited and are not able to get that information across because normally it would be. Um, you know, having to tell someone that perhaps you don't really trust. If you have an anonymised portal, you know, most people do have, obviously, you know, internet connection, Wi-Fi, particularly nowadays, you know, that, that can actually really help things like getting those reports and those incidents to the right place and, and, get, and getting the right response um, in real time. So that there are things like that that do need to be innovated, I think, quite quickly. And I think that there are some organisations that are, you know, going to sort of struggle to keep up and, and again that's where things like standards can really help yeah. with with getting those resources in yeah absolutely um i mean we're less involved in what we would call downstream which is sort of customer facing and so forth and there most certainly are ethical issues with that and i think we're bombarded in the in the we're not bombarded we're encouraged to think about that in in various news programs and so forth the impact typically upstream which is the supply chain that's probably less of a feature where we see digital, is it, is it a useful tool to actually raise awareness of issues and gather more data about what's happening and get that actually faster mm -hmm. and quicker to inform mm -hmm. ourselves? Um, but I think there's, there's the, so the positive side of the digital thing, but the downstream, we're probably less competent to talk to, to be honest with you. Yeah, understood. Mm -hmm. Right, any more uh, observations from the uh, audience? He says, looking through the bright lights. Over there. Otherwise, one over there. On your right. Yes, sorry, I see your hand. Right next to the microphone, perfectly placed. Hi there, um, John Apper, Allied Insulators. Um, I'm just trying to think how to frame this question correctly, so <coughs> forgive me if I'm rambling for a few minutes. But um, I think um, it's probably for Peter. Here. I think consumerism is obviously a great um, barometer or, or tool that that can help drive uh, 
demand and supply responses, ethical demand and supply responses in, in the supply chain. You mentioned a few examples, Boohoo, and some others. But <clears throat> from a business to business um, uh, uh, aspect, we've spent many years um, driving competitive advantage in supply chains um, at the cost of UK industry. Um, and what I'd like to know is um, how much influence do you think we can have or how much influence do you think the UK industry can have uh, on those supply chains? There is an ultimate total desire to do the right thing by all business owners and uh, you know, business people. But is there an actual willingness to pay more for an ethically sourced product or service? And, and when, when do you think that will, that will, that will come about? I think there's about three questions there. Which, yeah. um, so uh, I think we, it would be good to say that Britain and British companies are often seen as leaders in this debate, partly because they're under a lot of scrutiny and there's very active media and NGOs, so it's a good thing. Um, part of, I think, what your question is, is, is that fair and is there a level playing field? So we don't just work with British companies. We work with a lot of European companies. We've got our first Bangladeshi company, South African company. So p part of the drive is to make this an international debate, not just a UK debate, because UK business shouldn't be disadvantaged. It's why the UN guiding principles are being turned into um, regulation as opposed to soft law, so it's not just the obvious few who are doing good work, but actually it's lifting all companies to start to think about these things. So that, that's... <coughs> 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 that's one aspect of it, excuse me. The second aspect is, oh, I'm not really, do you want to ask We'll come back to this one. Back Let's to come it. back. Davina, did you want to come in on the same question? Or, or, or Andy, maybe a question for you about that sort of uh, <coughs> uh, business opportunity. Frankly speaking, is being a purposeful organization good for business, to be brutal mm -hmm. in this? Yeah, ab well, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think, yeah. particularly in the long term, I think those businesses who don't reposition towards being purpose-led are frankly you know, going to be in a tricky time in another five, ten years, whether it's consumer um, op opinion and, and you know, kind of uh, individuals speaking with their pound or the impacts of climate change. You know, I just think sticking our heads in the sand if we're not mm. getting ready to think about how do I make my, my organisation sustainable in mm. the long term. So I think, yes, absolutely. On, on that point, it's also around the kind of, you know, what we, you know, going through the standards and assessing ourselves against them, picked up was also, you know, it, it's getting that message down, and giving line of sight right the way through the organisation to say, well, this is, you know, this is how we make decisions. So within the supply chain teams, do they feel enabled, empowered, educated <coughs> in order to make the right decisions? And, okay, not every time are you going to necessarily be... be picking the most sustainable thing if you're way outside the cost envelope. Mm -hmm. But the, you know, having the legitimacy to have the conversation and to challenge that budget to make a better decision, I think is something that we can do internally to ease that. But also going back to the kind of digital point, I think there's a, we have a, a very good, very strong and open relationship with top tier, tier one suppliers, and, and we select them on their ability to help us deliver <coughs> our purpose. I think, you know, for me, the opportunity is then how do you drive that down through our supply chain, and how can we help provide resource, particularly to SMEs, to understand, you know, their impact and how they can deliver a better outcome for us, um, but, you know, get that information kind of back up and be able to kind of make decisions more effectively using that information. Yeah, all right. You don't I think I'll stop choking in. now. So <laughs> <coughs> I think one of the points you made was um, how can an individual business um, drive change? And sometimes it can, but even the bigger ones have limitations. So, for example, the work I talked about in Myanmar, that brought 12 companies together who worked on that together, co-funded it, but more importantly, were involved in developing that. We're often bringing companies together either on their own or with NGOs and trade unions to work through these issues, because often it's, it's bigger than that. And I think the last point you touch on, I may not have covered this very well, is um, th there is a lot of scrutiny for the obvious brands are in the, in, the, um, in the retail sector, in the public side. But actually, the public sector is still typically reliant on contracts. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I do um, is I sit on a parliamentary group 
which is looking at their own services because there isn't a strong retail signal, if you like. There isn't a customer signal coming through there. So they're trying to look at how do they bring their standards into life? How do they go beyond, have you read the contract and did you sign the document, into not just what we want you to do, but to your point, with SMEs and others, how can we help you do that? How can we help you deliver on the values that we want to see? Which is a more difficult challenge, but it's where we've got to go to if, as you rightly say, we've got to drive this through the value chain. It can't just sit with a few lead firms. Yeah, it can't just be those in the public eye, it's got to be everybody. Um, Davina, let's just move on to the standard, the safeguarding standard, BS 25800. Um, what impacts do you see that having on organisations? How will they look different if they use the standard? Yeah, I think the impacts could be really significant. I mean, one of the things that I think the safeguarding committee really tried to work towards was making sure that this standard was really accessible. So one of the challenges or criticisms quite often that happens in the area of safeguarding is there's a lot of you know jargon that's used. It's it's you know there are smaller kind of community-based organisations sometimes that are you know really keen to um, you know implement these minimum standards, but actually there's limited guidance. There's there's limited resources. You might have one person that may be responsible for for kind of implementing these these processes um, in place. So the language we really kind of focused on how do we make this really accessible and really user-friendly um, and something that can be adapted in a lot of different contexts. So the, you know, the committee was very broad, we had a lot of different representation um, and so the, I think the impact that we're going to hopefully see, I'm sure I'm very confident, um, is that this is something that's going to really plug a gap that's been very much um, ongoing where we've got the, on one side, a lot of people, I think you referred to earlier, of kind of scrabbling and running around and thinking, yes, I've heard of this, you know, modern slavery statement. I've heard that we need to, you know, sort out our safeguarding, but actually I don't really know what that means. Mm -hmm. You know, and, you know, I have a lot of other, you know, um, agendas or issues that I'm being pulled towards. So how do you want me to focus on this thing that, you know, to, for, for me not being a an expert, for example, in, in, you know, as someone who may be saying that in an organisation, you know, this is something that they could access quite easily and then, you know, split out into those different categories that we discussed earlier around the training side, around the prevention side, mm -hmm. around the, um, the response side as well. And of course, the, the reporting that we talked about, which is really, really integral to safeguarding. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're very short of time, but I might ask each of you just for one example of something, or one impact that you expect to see standards having uh, in your organisations from the standards that you're familiar with. What, could, what, what is the most uh, uh, impactful thing that you think uh, the standard will deliver? And maybe Andy, you can go first. We'll finish with Peter. Yeah, so well, as we're talking about supply chain, I'll use that uh, as an example. So, you know, we, have, we use benchmarks to assess how well we're doing against various elements of sustainability and, and purpose, and we've just gone through an assessment against PAS 808. We know that we can do better from a supply chain perspective, so we've completely rewritten our supplier code of conduct as a result of that, and we're also now developing a, a supplier engagement program off the back of the, the kind of conversation that we've just been having, saying, you know, we've had a really good relationship with our tier one suppliers, but how do we drive that down through the system? Um, so I think that's going to help us develop that over the next yeah, year or so. All right. Davina? Um, I think the main impact um, will be, you know, safer operations. And, you know, when we talk about safer operations, that element of really promoting the the welfare of the people that come into contact with that organisation with, with the focus on those more vulnerable groups. Um, you know, you'd be surprised, but actually for a lot of um, organisations or businesses at the moment, um, you know, it's very variable where, where they are in this kind of journey. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the standard's really going to help with that. The level of consistency yeah. right across. Exactly. Yeah. And Peter, the final word to you. Sort of micro and macro, actually, I've just noted 25800, which I wasn't aware of to my shame. So um, <laughs> we've done quite a lot of work on safeguarding, but it'll be great it's to very benchmark new, so. mm -hmm. against so, that. Thank you for letting Obliged me off the hook. on the 25th of June. There you we? go. But on a macro level, there's something called the base code, which is essentially ILO core conventions for dummies, if you like. And we will be revising that in the coming year or so. And I think we didn't take cognizance enough of BSI standards. So on the macro level, I think we should keep that dialogue going and make sure we can draw from the great work that BSI has done and strengthen our base code so there's alignment and commonalities we go forward. Excellent. 
Well, great panel. Please join me in thanking our panel today. Andy, Davina, Peter. Thanks very much, guys. I'll let you step off.